Wow, Ethan, great moves. Keep it up, proud of you. Buckle up my Bloodrush Bellow fans. We've got a brand new build of Bloodrush Levia for you today. Uh, well, I can't say it's too new, honestly. It is what's tried and tested. It's what's been working for a while now. It's a return to normalcy because there's been a lot of spice as of late with Levia builds. Royal Levia doing pretty well. Full Aggro Levia doing decently. Uh, but at the end of the day, there is one reliable way to play Levia that is the most flexible, and that is just mid-range claws with recursion baked in. And it's what I'm going to be taking to a double header pro quest this weekend. So I've been grinding games on the side and had a pretty decent run last night. So I figured I'd go ahead, upload them with some commentary and hopefully equip you all with the best tools possible to bring home a pro quest season three win with Levia. It hasn't happened yet. This is the last weekend. Come on, we can get it done league. Quick gameplay on the screen today, and I do mean quick, we've sped this up quite a bit because I didn't want the video to just take forever, but I jam a lot of games on the side, you know, tends to be late at night, uh, brain's half asleep, but I uh, <laughs> use this other alias as well, White Lotus, love that show, uh, really just because, unfortunately, I'm not trying to like have conversations if I'm just half awake playing Talishar at like 3am, right? So this is just a bunch of games uh, sampled from a late night play session yesterday where I was jamming almost like 20 games or so uh, with this pretty vanilla, just mid-range Claw Levia list. Now it's nothing super innovative. Uh, it's something we've seen do really well in the past. Um, well, I wouldn't say really well. The Levi is still lacking her big wins beyond just um, really the Pumble version that was pretty good in Starvo and Chain Meta. Uh, the, the Blood Debt builds, they, they lack a little something still, even with perfect play, they're the builds that are more susceptible to variants, but we still chase those wins. And uh, I definitely need the practice because this weekend I'm double booked for two pro quests and I haven't really been playing Flesh and Blood a lot lately. I've been very busy with moving uh, real life work stuff and of course prep work for as at this point you probably heard. I will be bringing the calling coverage live on the YouTube channel next week. So please tune in for that. Uh, what we've got in front of us though are a couple games today. And the first one here is against Bravo. And Bravo is a really fun matchup because it's one of the games where you really can toy with your opponent's approach to the matchup. Uh, the, the Bravos can play very differently. They're a very flexible deck. They can play very aggressive. They can play very defensive. They can play for uh, a very like turtle play style into just big disruption, pummel, crippling, save their HP for those kind of pivot points. They can do a lot of things very um, that, that are very adaptive to the Leviathan play style, but you as the Leviathan player can abuse pretty much any playstyle if they lock into one version too early. Like if they're going full turtle, my goodness, you just get free reign to walk all over them with recursion pieces. If they're going full aggro, then you actually do just beat their rate of damage. If they're going for like that turtle strat, saving big uh, crippling pummel turns, that can be kind of the most volatile way to, to play the matchup. Uh, you don't have too much control over when things line up, but ideally you want to uh, save push turns into when they are obviously trying to keep larger hands. Um, you can't really always call that bluff, right? But that's the idea. It becomes a lot easier to play around that if you're running like energy potions in the list. But regardless, uh, this Bravo opponent from you can see even during these opening turns, they're going for just what they consider good rate trades. They're going to block for three on the majority of their cards, but then with that last card in hand, they're going to make the call to keep it and swing an Othos for four. They're now turning one card into four damage or use that card to set up an arsenal for hopefully a bigger push. So the Bravo tries to play the good value game against a Leviah of all matchups. And Leviah is a deck that should always beat value gameplay. If all you're doing is trying to get, you know, the highest number you can card per card, Leviah does that incredibly well. She's got base stats that are pretty nuts on a lot of her cards, like Endless Maw, Dread Screamer, of course we know. And then she has this recursion package in Deep Rooted Evil and Hal From Beyond that can just be oppressive when you're throwing these consistent amounts of damage for not much effort, you know, off the back of like one unworldly bellow. You can launch a Deep Rooted Evil with a Howl on top, uh, refilling your graveyard, making sure a new six is in there while you buy turns finding Artivore, finding Blood Rush, things like that. So I really do appreciate when a Bravo plays this way because it tends to be the easiest way for Leviathan to actually just win, especially if you can keep your armor for that 
kind of mid-game pivot where they realize, oh, their blood debt's pretty high. Let's just try to slam a crippling crush at them or something. If you've got the ability to pivot away from that with Husk, you pretty much just win. Because ideally, they only get one, maybe two opportunities to say, I will just eat your damage to throw my hand, and their hand being a big disruptive hand, right? If you can just survive that first one with your armor, uh, maybe not the first one. If you can survive the first one, maybe just take it. Maybe use your other equipment suite instead of carrying husk like I did in this matchup. Then you are safe to survive the second, and then you should pretty much never let them get to the third. Because you will have overwhelming pressure if all they're doing on the in-between turns is like throwing a Nothos, who cares? And you'll just start to outvalue everything they're trying to do. Your rate is better than theirs, and they really get put on the back foot in trying to recover into the game. Where can they find their pivot point if it's not off the back of a very telegraphed, I will eat your damage to throw crippling, right? So as we see the game play out, the one thing that's coming up uh, that's a little strange here is my blood rushes have come really early. And while that may seem like a good thing, into Bravo, it's not a perfect strategy because throwing all these blood rushes early with the Bravo being so defensive from the get go can actually make you stutter in that like kind of later phase of the game where you're trying to close and make sure that they don't have that opportunity to push with a larger hand. Because with all three blood rushes gone at this point, they're still at 13. 13 with enough armor for them to realistically pivot once more, right? So that one more pivot point that they're hopefully going for is why I've got my husk up to prevent that swing in the game. Now, if it is backed by a pummel, the best thing I can do is try to set up a Boneyard Marauder in Arsenal so that no matter what, even if it's a crippling plus pummel, I'll be able to keep one card in hand, even if it's a red, pay for Boneyard Marauder and just not lose. So now that my Blood Rushes are gone, that needs to be something I'm always cognizant of, and it's what I'm gonna try to play for as the game goes on here. But if their life gets even a little bit lower, there is more freedom to start playing out Boneyard Marauder. Just throw as much damage as possible because at this point they really don't have choices anymore on when they want to keep a hand. Now the Bravo, just to note by the way, has 27 cards in deck to my 35. You don't start looking at a fatigue situation this early, but one of the things to realize is when a deck just throws their full hand for four, full hand for four, full hand for four just to block, they're not recovering any cards into their deck, right? They're not pitching to really have anything set up specifically for second cycle. I believe in this game we've seen him pitch, uh, I think it was just like one Crippling Crusher, so it's like, that's obviously there, but they're already so low on life, I'm not afraid of that Crippling anymore. It's really just what's left in this first cycle, right? So, this is really going well. It, it, it looks really great for Leviah. All we need to do is never miss a beat. If we end up in a position where we just throw six damage, then that is just a natural window Bravo has to just you know, rip that last crippling that he's got in first cycle here. Um, or I guess he just pitched one there. I think there's still one more in first cycle here. Uh, if all I do is throw six, then that does leave me at risk of just not presenting enough for Bravo to really care. And they get free room to throw a crippling that does then buy them enough HP to throw that last disruptive piece. So as I mentioned, that's the game plan we want to play around there. So. We need to just do everything we can to dig for more than six damage per turn. Six damage is incredibly poor uh, rate when you're looking at a full hand, right? If you turn five cards into six damage, what are you doing with your life? So we had to play a little bit strange there. We played a this rounds on me to go ahead and dig for a buff card, a go again. And we were lucky there in finding that on worldly bellow red. But to be fair, we're about to approach our pitch stack. So we kind of have a sense of everything that's left in the deck because we've played the Blood Rushes and I believe one Artivore, right? So we've dug eight cards advanced into this pitch stack. And so we are realistically seeing the entire deck with about like this hand, right? So this round's on me at that point. Uh, we knew what resources were left. The Unworldlies were a great hit. Convulsions was fine. Dread Screamer was fine. Artivore, all those things were fine. Uh, so good payoff there. Now we just continue with the, the game plan of never throw six. Do everything we can to not do that. Now there was a bit of a risky line in that last turn. I did block with Hal from Beyond. It was a bit late to see it. That card, if you see it early, is just free damage in this matchup. Uh, but no matter when you do find it, it's super relevant, right? You're able to just recycle three damage on a stick 
uh, that you're going to throw on top of your Deep Rooted Evil, that you're going to banish with Unworldly, maybe play multiple times in a turn. The card is just insanely good. So I did want to just get it out of hand, but it did leave me at three misses in the graveyard, which I believe might be the first time this game that, that that's the position I was put in, and it, and it was a con uh, like a choice I made to go ahead, go ahead and just let that be. Uh, I'm so ahead at this point that yes, if I whiff Blood Debt on that swing big turn and took 12, I'm still not really afraid of losing the game. Uh, so it was it was a risk that's, that I'm willing to take. You know, having a Howl set up for free just feels so good. So we went that route. Um, now, as we continue on here, that was the pitch stack, right? I believe that Soul Harvest was what I pitched first and foremost. So now we know that we've concentrated some really decent blues in the deck that line up really well with Deep Rooted Evil. When you start pitching Unworldly Bellows, Convulsions, and Dread Screamers specifically, those cards actually have such great synergy moments with Deep Rooted Evil and Howl. Even though they're just blues, what they do is clear the graveyard uh, with Go Again, whether it's Dread Screamer, Four Go Again, uh, Convulsions, you know, plus one Dominate, Go Again lets you attack, um, the Unworldly, plus two, whatever. As long as you can throw those in as part of your Deep Rooted Evil Howl loop, they're really great value. I mean, at this point, right, any damage is good damage. Uh, all we need to do is keep applying pressure. We've got this Boneyard that's sitting in Arsenal since probably like six turns ago, right, when I mentioned that what we need to do is not die to Crippling Pummel, right? So we're just trying to make sure our four card plays are really strong, and they will be consistently strong as long as we even have these blues in deck that enable the Howl Deep Rooted Loop. So I think this game just really shows off how strong this is and just how little your opponent can do to interact with it uh, in the late game, because we'll never miss Blood Debt as long as we're pitching this through. Like even in our eventual second pitch stack, we're throwing back something like a Blue Convulsions, which is just as good. Well, not just as good. It's worse than like a Blue Dread Screamer, but it's still the enabler card we need and it'll even give us Dominate potentially just win the game right off the bat, right? So we're turning these hands into basically must block states, turn after turn after turn. And I think if you looked at the cards in deck even a couple turns ago, like I mentioned, it didn't really seem like Bravo was going to deck out. He still had like 25 something cards left in deck, but because their strategy has just been, well, we don't really have our pivot, so we just need to survive. Look what happens. You, you just can't really survive. Like, it's not possible, right? Look how consistent the damage is. At this point, it's not incredibly above rate. But it's been, you know, 10, 12, higher sometimes, just to make sure that we're still presenting enough that Bravo has no room to breathe. And that's all we need to do, because there is eventuality in convulsions, in writhing, in reckless swing for sure. <laughs> At this point, the worst card that's coming up is this Scar for Scar, because we're not running gamblers here. Uh, that extra block is really critical against Bravo and Skull Crushers. Uh, I think we, we rolled. Scapskin's a little bit early because we had the room to, but now we're not trying to just like punt the game off rolling a one, right? So we rolled when we had room. Now we don't anymore. Uh, and we actually deck out the Bravo, which is pretty hilarious. Like that game, that game's fantastic. Uh, I, I really wish every round of Swiss could could go like that and just make people so impressed with what Leviah is doing, because that was a perfect example of what makes Leviah potentially too good. Like seeing recursion pieces be played that many times is way more oppressive than, you know, an Unhallowed Rites looping a uh, Howl From Beyond back in like a chain deck, right? I mean, that's still very good, but Leviah can do this like on demand, turn after turn after turn, and it looks pretty insane. Like it's very hard to fatigue out a Leviah. Uh, but new game, new game on the screen. This is versus Kano, and it's a bit of a fast one, uh, even at like 200% speed or whatever going out here. The main thing to realize into a Kano is that it is very much dependent on you finding Blood Rush. So in your early hands, you really should just pitch everything into Arcane Barrier. It's why I like taking Arcane Barrier 3, even though it does slow you down. If you have the room to just pitch in constantly to Arcane Barrier, draw new hands, then, you know, what does that do? It does bring you closer to Art of War, it does bring you closer to Blood Rush, does bring you closer to Pulping, which I also have in it for this matchup. So that's all you're trying to do is use the ability to pitch to just find your good power cards, because luckily those don't require you having a graveyard set up. Then they all actually fuel your graveyard for future pushes. So Blood Rush, of course, being an absolute key piece here. But the thing about Blood Rush is uh, it really makes the Kano's life total 
that much more under pressure. I mean, a low end blood rush is 18 damage. When you can get it off off the back of even like a hooves play, like a like what is about to come up here, for potentially uh, what what is this going to be like 26 damage or whatever. That is so overwhelming for Kano to deal with, and with Spellfray Cloak as your chest piece, you get a lot of room to say, well, my turn is going to be so big that you likely die, so make your call now, whether or not to kill me or not, and you're likely to be high enough from those early pitching that you're doing to find your blood rushes, right, that you then are able to survive with even one or two resources floating and the spell fray cloak to just not die to their combo. Now, is this a super consistent game plan? Not really. It is very dependent on blood rush, but at least it's a very winnable game. Skill based gameplay by the gamers says Kano. <laughs> so I thought that was a funny one because, you know, that is very much a high roll game. It's not going to happen every time, but we still took the lines that we had to to make that matchup more winnable rather than like keep a two card hand to play swing big, pitch a blue, right? Like that might seem good at first. Uh, no, it's really not what wins you the game. Spending two cards for six damage to fill the graveyard by one, also making you waste a blue. That's really not what's going to get you across the finish line versus a Kano. Uh, so now we've got a different game here. This is Dromai, and of course it's hard to tell these days what version of Dromai it is, because Iris Dromai has become a thing. It's like Prism Reborn, and the deck is funky. Uh, I, I don't quite know how I feel about the matchup. I've only played it maybe three or four times now, and unfortunately it feels like the worst parts of a prism matchup, which is basically how much you're forced to roll scab skins, but there is no like blowout scenario where ALS just loses you the game. So you're still forced to just roll scabs a ton to manage aura clear, uh, but you can't just lose the game instantly off the back of like a one that they then drop an ALS on and the game is just over. So it's still not a fun matchup to play. It's not fun for you because you have to roll scabs so much, it's not fun for your opponent when you do hit on scabs. Uh, but overall, I think it's a very manageable game. Uh, and I mean, if a brute started to lose to Illusionist super consistently, then we're just doing something wrong as br brute players, right? We'd have to retool the deck. <laughs> but I do think it's a little bit harder than the standard dragon versions of Dromai, because especially this build is built to handle that version a bit better. Like I'm bringing in pulping so that I can throw it at a Miragai and no matter if it hits or not, it has go again and then I can continue with like the rest of my turn. I'm bringing in Ghostly Visit to also kill Miragai right at that four break point. The deck isn't really built around using scabs that much, but then again, like how can you be that built around scabs? Scabs will just hit or it won't. So what that means is we need to work it into our game plan to instead of block with a six in hand that we are likely to do against a normal Dromai, we're gonna keep that extra card per turn cycle to try to invest into a Mandible Claw Swing off the back of Scab Skins. So that's like the one playstyle change you really need in approaching this matchup. Um, but, you know, the thing to note is the damage you throw at their face is, I mean, it's relevant, right? But you really need to be scared of leaving auras in this m version in particular. It's not like, against Prism where, oh, you know what? They've got like one Merciless out. That's okay. You know, that's not gonna be game losing if it lasts like one turn cycle, whatever. Uh, but this version, if they stick like a Shimmers of Silver, holy moly, like that needs to get off the field. You have to, it's a must kill. Um, their Burn Them Alls as well or something you can't clear. So if you've ever ignored their other like Shimmers, then when they play a Burn Them All and it gets that counter, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just gonna stick as long as it sticks. So you need to be very careful about ignoring auras, especially if your turn ends up being a bit of a dud, like you draw a Leviathan, you don't hit scabs, and all you do is like throw six at face. Well, they're probably pretty happy to just take it and then swing back with all these auras in play that all of a sudden deal four each, which is, I mean, it's not like they have a hit effect, but that's still a lot of damage per. So we have to look for opportunities like this where that was an all red kind of clunky hand that luckily already had blood debt turned off because of the Mark of the Beast discard. What else am I gonna do with that hand? I can throw it face 
uh, but there's two auras in play, so I can go ahead, try to roll scabs here, even though it's an all red hand, it doesn't let me reset arsenal. If I clear their auras, there isn't that much more they can likely do with the turn, and all of a sudden the amount of cards they have in hand is no longer a scary thing. Like we see exactly here, they just play out an aura on like a three card hand, that's all they do. So we had the room to pitch our reds really inefficiently that way, just to get some aura clear going, so that then we buy ourselves a new turn, re reset with an arsenal that's actually really strong. I mean, Go Again is fantastic, right, with this Dread Screamer, uh, and just go about our day. And the way damage trades in this matchup is actually really interesting. It's something that I don't really take too much note of because, for the most part, like, I don't lose this matchup. So, um, you know, if you're not at zero, who cares? It's not like you have to play around Merciless or, like, burn them all dealing arcane damage, right? So, uh, it is funny to note, though, how it does line up here. We're very equal on life for how ahead it feels like the scabs rolls have uh, let me get this game. You know, I've been doing a great job at Aura Clear, uh, even investing a bit of natural go again into Aura Clear. The, the way damage has traded is actually still very even. So what we're looking for is for the Dromine to really miss a beat and find a turn where uh, they don't even drop an aura. Maybe they just have that clunky all blue hand. Uh, and then we really abuse that throw face and that can really mess up with how their turn cycle wants to play because they have a lot of blue two blocks in their auras, in their pursuits, right? So if they kind of miss a turn on the play and then you swing back into them, they're likely to have drawn up that hand that they want to invest in board state that doesn't block very well. So you kind of, it's a bit of a push and pull in where you want to find your turns of pressure. Like right now, I would way prefer to have an Artivore or a Blood Rush in Arsenal so that I can really kind of demand the big turn out of my deck um, just by playing out that arsenal piece. But for now, it's a bit of a safe play. Boneyard Marauder in Arsenal is very strong for just drawing into Blood Rush right off the top of the deck. So at least that line is open to us. Uh, but, you know, from what we see here in how we're throwing cards, they do just block out really effectively. So if we're not going above those rates of damage, then it's still kind of tough for us to really close and win. Because the thing about it is this Dromai deck does tank really well. They've got all the sinks, all the fates, all the sand covers, unmovables. Uh, they, I think Oasis maybe. They are very set to just turn defensive. And Normal Prism couldn't really play that way. Like Normal Prism normally had too many non-blocks in their deck to really play that way into a Levia. But it is a way you can pivot to beating a Levia that's not prepared to overcome a fatigue strategy. Because if you kind of naturally stumble in this matchup, take like a first big chunk of blood debt or something, then the Prism player can see that, or not the Prism player, sorry, Dromai, and instead try to turtle up and let you naturally stumble a second time and really close the game on you. Because if you have to divert a lot of your damage into clearing auras, but then you also kind of accelerate how fast the game's going to end because you deal damage to yourself, those situations can start to look really, really dire. And the deck blocks so well that if you don't set up your big turns, then you could just kind of teeter out and not be able to close the game. So you do have to look for uh, Scabskin's pushes that don't just clear auras, that also deal damage and land really great damage, like in this situation here. That Scabskin's play off the back of an Artivore uh, allowed us to swing uh, 13, or was it 12 at face, uh, and then summon Blasmfet and basically make it a must clear type of scenario because I mean, Blasmfet sticking on the board, if all they want to do on their turn is drop an aura, then that means for sure Blasmfet sticks, and that's pretty incredible. So, of course, they, they can't let that happen, and that will buy you a lot of room, because the more damage you can present on a turn that already showed Blasmfet, the better, because they need to kill him. So they will take damage, because they need to at least keep two cards to return kill the Blasmfet, and then you get all the damage that lands on them because they need to keep two cards on top of winning that turn cycle because their damage goes into Blasmafet, not you. So you can see how the life just completely flipped on that last turn cycle. It went from pretty even, in fact, I think it was like even a little bit behind or something, to now completely turning around. And we actually just present lethal like on the next turn here, which is pretty incredible. Um, granted, you know, Scabskins hit, I think like a little bit more than it didn't. 
Uh, I didn't track exactly how many rolls there, but I think I rolled maybe like five times and hit three, missed two, something like that. Um, so, hey, that's that's good news. Not every game's going to be like that, though. Some games are the one and two of one, but that's the world we live in. That's the lifestyle we've chosen as Leviathan players. Uh, but here we go. This is against our fellow brute, Reinar. And Reinar is a matchup that, like, it's a bit of a weird one because you do more above rate things than Reinar could ever do. Like Reinar is really not a deck that does above rate things unless you just let barraging beatdowns give plus four and don't block it, right? Or like, <laughs> heaven forbid, like bad beats or rumble grunting. Like, sure, those cards can be above rate, but the rest of the stuff that Reinar does is just worse than what you do. So what can really blow out the matchup is if he lands intimidate hands that really mess you up. Because Leviah dances that fine line between needing to block to fill her graveyard and needing to craft very specific combo hands rather than just, oh, you intimed this kind of thing, so I'll just throw this block now and my hand will still, you know, come in for three go again, three go again, one or whatever, right? That's not how Leviah plays. So Intimidates can really mess up how this game trades. Uh, now, we saw kind of a decent Intimidate out the Reinar to get them started on a bit of a life lead. But I don't feel bad about that return. I mean, hey, that was a blood rush, right? So how can you hate it? What we still need to be super cautious of is when Reinar goes nuts um, and lines up that full Intim hand, can we capitalize on the full return keep? Because if that hand that was fully Intimed didn't have natural go again, then that really puts us in a bind of relying on our own scab skins to push that turn forward. And this is kind of a weird situation here, but I think overall it's a win. I rolled Scabskins because this hand only had one action point, right? It rolled a six, but then my opponent uses Gambler's Gloves and re-rolls it into a three. Overall, it does lose me a lot of damage, but I think I'm still okay with it because what this means is the Reinar is now less likely to roll Scabskins and I still have my safety net to protect against when Reinar forces that Intim hand through and I need to turn a hand large, right? So Reinar gets a really good playoff here. Uh, they're able to return Pulping plus two blues for 12 damage. That's really good rate for them off uh, three cards, right? I don't have as good a rate coming back. Uh, I've just got Scar for Scar, Scar for Scar into Claw, which is gonna only be 11 damage off three cards. I would have preferred to block with the this rounds on me, but it was intimed away, so it is what it is. But Scar for Scars definitely pull a lot of weight in letting you come back from those little bit of behind positions you might find yourself in. Now, speaking of being behind, this is kind of an insane turn out of the Reinar. It is double Blood Rush, right? And it looks a bit awkward at first because it started with a skull crack pitch but it hit Beast Within, uh, right, that was the only card they had left in hand, into them having enough resources to perfectly pull this off. I mean, that is a 26 damage hand out of the Reinar. Uh, incredible, incredible, because um, that was just off four cards plus the Tunic resource. So what can I do to come back from that? Well, basically what I have to do is hope and pray that the Reinar deck suffers from some inconsistencies because they don't have hands that are always that live, right? It's very much tied to uh, their blood rushes, very much tied to uh, how many barragings they've got set up. So we're fortunate here in that um, th this is a bit of a misclick situation because that actually didn't have dominate. So we, we go back on this and fix it. Um, but this is just a fortunate thing. If that had hit dominate, the game would look a lot different but it doesn't, so I'm able to say, okay, well, I don't get my Blood Rush turn off anymore, but I also don't lose the game. And not losing the game is good, because the longer the game goes, hopefully the more above-rate things I can do in comparison to what Reinar can do. This turn, though, overall, not great. Like I said, I lost the Blood Rush line, because um, I had to go in and block there, and also the uh, mode I chose on Art of War was probably a bit too greedy. I was hoping to, like, follow up with a claw, so hitting go again would effectively be three damage to the turn. Instead, there wasn't enough resources for that, so I should have just said plus one, uh, so that there was at least, you know, plus one to the turn rather than nothing. Uh, but things are still working out. The Reinar is missing their big hand. I am worried, though, because they're about to have Tunic up. I'm not pressuring too much to really be able to make them full block around uh, you know, a potential like last blood rush hand that they have, right? Like that kind of thing is always going to win them the game. So what I need to do is try to still present enough that I can 
get around, um, you know, forcing them into a weird, like, reckless swing position or, like, closing with a uh, writhing beast hulk, something like that. If I can get them to that state first, then all I have to do is survive and I'll, well, survive and turn off blood debt, to be fair, which is a bit different uh, than what Reinar has to do. If Reinar can just get me to two, they can pivot into full blocking out and eventually win through Reckless, because I can't help it, I have to attack. I have to attack, because I need to turn off Blood Debt, whereas they can just get me to two and stop attacking, and just preserve their life. So that's really the race we're playing, and I do actually get them to two first. Now they, they keep this hand for um, an Alpha Rampage, which I think is still right by them, because in a way, if they had left me with uh, even one non-block there, I do just straight lose. So. They, they played it right. I think that was a good call from them. There are enough non-blocks that that was pretty realistic that it happened. Uh, they also hit a pretty good banish there and made me block with the Endless Maw. So in return here, I do still need to be wary of, yes, I don't have gamblers anymore, um, but I can't just present six. Just presenting six gives them way too big a window, uh, especially since if I can throw even that extra claw attack out, that's gonna demand a card at this point. So I do roll scabs and I'm lucky to hit there, uh, but hey, only to be fair, <laughs> I'm lucky to hit. I was unlucky to get the endless mob banish in the first place because it's still nine damage no matter how you cut it, right? So I was pretty convinced I actually won here because of the uh, Writhing Beast Hulk dominate, but they're running unmovables, which I actually think I saw at some point, but just totally forgot about. Uh, either way, still pretty fortunate that the Reckless Swing didn't <laughs> hit the discard there, uh, because if it did, then I'd be at one now, and I would once again just be dead to another Reckless Swing, because I think Reinar's run maybe like definitely at least two, I don't know about three, uh, but yeah, just be a scary situation. So we're fortunate to not have that be the reality, and we just continue forth with hopefully doing enough for them to just lose. Uh, uh, with that Writhing Beast Hulk not landing, we're a little bit slowed down here because, uh, you know, a, a Dominate is not something that's super common in the deck. We've got, we're not running Pulpings in this matchup, so it is just the three Writhing Beast Hulks. It's the Convulsions. So in the meantime, while we find those hands or find a bigger breakpoint push with like Art of War or Blood Rush, uh, we just do what we can. And this hand starts looking pretty promising until we draw the resources we do. Uh, we would have loved to swing uh, 12 there total with Boneyard Marauder into Deep Rooted Evil, but unfortunately it would mean losing our arsenal. And in this position, the Dread Screamer Red is so important in arsenal that, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to just lose both of those to throw 12 right then and there, but in a way it actually would have ended the game. So that was a bit of just a bad call on my end, I guess, because they did throw that Reckless Swing, uh, which it hit, which did put me to one. So like I said, lucky that that other Reckless Swing didn't hit. Uh, but yes, I could have just closed the game on the last turn. Instead, we do it now. Uh, with a dominate on that dread screamer so uh, always always a nail biter those reinar games but overall i do feel pretty good and we overcame a double blood rush like don't forget that was a 26 damage blood rush turn the only blood rush we played didn't even lead to claw claw swing i'm pretty sure it was just like claw attack and we still won that game so overcoming some crazy odds i would think <laughs> this is kind of dummy impressive uh, but now we hit a bad matchup so Phi is really rough for this deck because just in the way that these decks play against each other, Phi just has somehow more numbers than you and yet doesn't worry about blood debt. I don't quite know how that's fair, but it is what it is. Their headpiece in Mask of the Pouncing Lynx tends to deal, well, when they break it, it's hopefully to deal seven to eight damage, which is more than your Carrion Husk gives you in defense, not to mention your Carrion Husk has blood debt and also has a life threshold they need to play around, right? So by the numbers, it's really rough because you also don't have hit effects to really make the Fi care about anything other than presenting lethal. So when they have their nuts hands, they will just keep them and throw them at you. And there's really not much you can do about it. So you just have to hope that you find your really good hands of your Scar for Scar into like, you know, Endless Maw or like Dread Screamer into Graveling, your Blood Rushes. You need to find those hands to have any kind of shot. Now. My opening, really, really poor. What's even worse about this kind of opening hand is there's nothing I could do about how badly this fills Graveyard. Uh, these cards are blues that you just have to run in the deck, like the Dread Screamers and Convulsions that were in that hand. I can't help it, there's not enough blue sixes, right? But we just saw them in a sequence that now my Graveyard is completely trashed. So really not looking forward to potentially whiffing on that later in the game. The best we can do is return a decent rate here in just one card for four damage. That's just good stuff. Uh, we're not 
tipping into blood debt just yet, the hand wasn't built for it anyway, so Fi continues along here with just never worrying about our damage and swinging with their full hand, because their full hand will just, on average, deal more than the Levi hand, unless the Levi hands are just perfectly in sequence, which, to be fair, can happen. Like, I don't think this matchup is awful, it's not a straight doomed matchup, but it definitely is pretty rough just because they are more consistent than you. So do what you can, always play to maximize value per card, uh, always look to use your arsenal to find a missing piece towards 4 damage per card, like the unworldly red in arsenal right now is hopefully waiting for a swing big. That'd be fantastic as a 3 card play for 12 damage, but instead we actually get lucky on a Scabskin's roll here to turn a 2 card hand into 8 damage, which is just as good as Swing Big would do, uh, and that's all off the back of Skull Crusher. So I run it for the block just to begin with, but you can get a bit of uh, Hail Mary situations going, like saving the rate of that kind of hand. I mean, what else would that hand do? First of all, Scabson needed to hit to make it even 6, but then Skull Crushers does push it to at least 8. <laughs> but now we face down Phi that has just continuously drawn the nuts. Uh, they already had that Art of War turn, now they have an Art of War plus Spreading Flames turn. There's pretty much nothing I can do to stop this from also being a Mask of the Pouncing Lynx turn just because of how wide they'll go. So the damage train will just continue forth here and really put the Phi ahead. Not much I can do about it. Uh, th there's no real point of interaction, right? It would be specifically bringing in, I guess, like, Command and Conquer is the one thing that could hopefully slow Fi down in these kind of situations, but the problem with Command and Conquer is that it also really clunks you up, and that it doesn't turn off Blood Debt. It's not a great rate to begin with, and is only really playable off the back of, like, an Art of War turn, uh, or Dread Screamer when you have something else to do with the floating resources that come from that. Like, I mean, hey, if you have Howl from Beyond, then holy moly, can you do a great, you know, Dread Screamer into Howl into CNC? I mean, that line is great, um, but not running it in this deck. I could totally see it as like maybe a two of, like two of Command and Conquer sounds pretty safe, honestly, uh, because at the end of the day, like these kind of hands don't win you the game either. Coming in for a three card hand for 10, not a great rate. We're not looking for that. We want more damage. We don't want the keyword dominate right now, but it is to note, I haven't really had a good turn yet. I have not had a single good turn with Leviah yet. Uh, it was just trying to make four damage per card so far. And that's okay, but it's not spiking with anything higher rate that comes from the back of like Blood Rush, right? Or even like Dread into uh, Red uh, Graveling or like Scar for Scar into an Endless Maw. Like those turns really push it. 13 damage off three, right? We haven't even had those turns yet. So instead, uh, this really starts to look like our first big push, but it's a little, a little too late more than anything. Uh, the Phi is sitting on four armor still, uh, they are pushing <laughs> lightning fast here, getting me all the way down to two, which is not quite danger zone, two is a lot better than one in this matchup, uh, but it definitely comes down to how well this blood rush lands, and the reality is uh, it just, I mean, I just lose here no matter what, I can't turn off blood debt with this hand. But this is to note, you know, if the early game was just a little bit better, if this hand was able to turn off blood debt, then, you know, there's a world where I actually win. And that's pretty impressive for a Levi deck that has a notoriously bad Phi matchup. So it gives me hope for the future. I mean, the Phi literally didn't block with like a single card until right now, and we still got him this close. So I consider that a win, and uh, hopefully a win for some of us in the ProQuest this weekend. <laughs>